breaks down upon our meeting here tonight. Invite him, invite him into our midst. Let us have an encounter with him. It is him we have come to meet tonight. We have come to hear from him. Let us ask that he takes his place, his rightful place in our midst tonight. That he alone be exalted. In the name of Jesus. The Lord my King, we bless your name. We worship you. Baba, you say, unto you shall the garden of your people be. And so, Father, this garden is unto you. Holy Spirit, have your way. Breathe life into this meeting tonight. Even as we have come, let us encounter you. In the name of Jesus. In a unique way, Father, let us encounter you. In Jesus' name. That even as we have come, we will not go back the same way. We will go back emboldened. We will go back enriched. We will go back in a new dimension. In the name of Jesus. Baba, have your way in our midst tonight. And let your name be glorified. That at the end of it all, Father, only you and you alone be glorified. We pray with thanksgiving. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let us worship, worship, invite God, God Almighty with our worship. Glory, honor, power and majesty be unto God. Amen. Glory and honor. Glory, honor, power, and majesty be unto God. Amen. Glory and honor, glory, honor, power, and majesty be unto God. Amen. Praise in our God. Praise in our God. Praise in our God. Oh, praise in His name. Praise in our God. Praise in our God. Oh, praise in our God. Praise in our God. With all our hearts, praise in our God. Praise in our God with all our heart. Always praise in our God. Praise in our God. Praise in our God. Always praise in our God. Praise in our God. Praise in our God. Always praise in our God. Praise in our God. We know. Praise in our God with all our hearts. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Hallelujah. Our God, our God is good to me. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Our God is our God is good to He can never never fail He has never never failed He has never never failed Jesus the same forever Hallelujah He can never never fail can never never it can never, never fail. Jesus do the same forever. Hallelujah. It can never, never fail. It can never, never fail. It can never, never fail. Jesus do the same forever. Hallelujah. It can never, never fail. He can never, never fail. Can never, never fail. Jesus, the same forever. Let us worship this God that never fails. Unto him we have come that he will not fail us. Tonight he will minister to us by himself. He will talk to us from his throne of grace. 
and that we will be blessed by it in the name of Jesus. And that at the end, only his name and his name alone will be glorified. Thank you, blessed Jehovah. We give you praise. Baba, have your way in our midst. Have your way in our midst. We open our hearts unto you and say, Father, speak to us. Speak to us in the way that only you can reveal yourself to us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we have come in search of you. Father, reveal yourself to us. Only you can teach us your ways. Man doesn't know your way. Your ways are far higher than ours. The way, the way you operate, Father, we cannot understand. Baba, have your way. Have your way in our midst. And at the end, Father, let only you and you alone be exalted. Thank you, blessed Jehovah. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Uh, tonight we'll still continue. We'll be continuing on our topic for the month, our theme for the month, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And uh, tonight we'll be taking on a different dimension. And uh, I'll be honest with you, as a believer, I am yet to meet anyone who will claim to know the Holy Spirit totally and fully. Uh, I do not claim to know. And so we have come to learn. And I believe we are sharing together here tonight. So it is, uh, it is, uh, it is a Bible studies. And so we have to we'll find ourselves contributing. Okay? We'll share, we'll share knowledge. So don't look at me as though I know it all. I do not. So that's, that's a, a disclosure out there. Uh, on matters of uh, the Trinity, I am yet to understand or yet to meet anybody who claims to know everything. And so we'll be taking something like a dive into the unknown here. We'll be diving into the unknown and trying to explore as much as we do. So uh, as we exchange, I think we'll be better for it. And then mentioning the mention of dive also reminds me of uh, this story of um, a giant uh, in, this, uh, in Native American mythology. There was this giant that was said to have descended from the, from the mountains. Uh, and then for the very first time in his life, he was seen the vast Pacific Ocean. He was so awed by it, the vastness of the ocean and the unending stretch. And so he came, went into the waters, felt it, and he loved it. Then he came with also a small jar in his hands. So he was filling water into the jar. And somebody who saw him asked him, and said, what are you going to do with that water? In response, he says, look, up in the mountains where I come from, my people haven't seen the ocean. And so I'm taking this to go back to them so that they would know what the ocean looks like. Then I'll ask you, if that giant takes the water back to his people in the jar, will his people be able to have a feel of what the ocean truly looks like? Would they be able to I tell us that little story so as to let us know that uh, whatever we discuss here today will just be a feel of what the Holy Spirit looks like, just a little feel of it. And it only goes to add to what other studies will have had about the Holy Spirit to make it whole, if it ever can be whole. Because I've come to find that uh, the more we learn of God or the more we think we know of God, there is so much more to learn of him. And so what we'll be doing here today will not be full uh, any uh, claim to uh, totality of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. But then, what have we learned so far? We have been discussing this topic, the Holy Spirit, for the last uh, two, three weeks. What have we learned so far? I'd like to ask us, what's what have we benefited or what have we gained so far as the Holy Spirit? What have we learned so far? Anybody? Anything you think you have learned about the topic, the Holy Spirit, so far, we have been discussing it. 
Anybody? I don't believe that we haven't learned anything. We must have. We've learned uh, a lot. Just a little about the lot. Beautiful. The Holy Spirit guides, he protects. Aha. Uh -huh. So you don't you don't tell us everything. There's still more. I believe there's still more. We learned about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Like one of such gifts. Love, kindness, beautiful. And that the Holy Spirit gives us such gifts. Okay, any other thing? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. That nobody can do anything. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we have to do. Amen? Thank you. Ah, so far we have learned about the nature of the Holy Spirit. I've tried to, I try, I try to do something like um, a summary of what we have learned so far so that at least we can follow, we can follow up you know, and be on track. I've, we, I think we have learned about the nature of the Holy Spirit and we learned that the Holy Spirit is divinity. Is that true? That the Holy Spirit is divinity. That the Holy Spirit, also known as the Holy Ghost, is the third person in the Holy Trinity, okay? There's God the Father, alongside God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus Christ, so, and then God the Holy Spirit. So three of, three of these personalities make the Trinity, correct? And that this means that the Holy Spirit is fully divine, okay? It's also fully co-equal and fully eternal with God the Father and God the Son. Is that correct? We also learned about the personality of the Holy Spirit, part of which we were mentioning there just now. That unlike an impersonal force, unlike uh, a deity, you know, an inanimate deity, the Holy Spirit possesses personal attributes. Possesses personal attributes like intellect. And that can be found in 1 uh, Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. As a matter of fact, that very uh, section of the Bible tells us a whole lot about the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit has intellect, the Holy Spirit has will, the Holy Spirit has emotions, and that the Holy Spirit can speak. All right? The Holy Spirit can speak. The Holy Spirit teaches, and then the Holy Spirit guides. But then he also tells us that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be vexed. All right? He can... He can we can do things that will cause the Holy Spirit to be angry with us. Correct? But then I ask myself, how can be the Holy Spirit be grieved? What can grieve the Holy Spirit? Can we think of anything that can grieve the Holy Spirit, that can make the Holy Spirit be angry? Sorry? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Just try to explain the word blasphemy well. What would blasphemy mean? Practically. Come back to what? A taboo. A taboo. Saying, would saying what the, what, saying something uh, against the Holy Spirit be blasphemy? Say, uh, the Holy Spirit didn't say, but you say the Holy Spirit said. That's misrepresenting the Holy Spirit. Would that, would that be blasphemy? Lying against the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, that was one word that I heard one time and it scared me. It was uh, Pastor, I try to remember his name now. A Nigerian pastor, though, one of these big churches, you know, he mentioned that, uh, he, said, he said, God forgive people for lying against the Holy Spirit when you say the Holy Spirit say when the Holy Spirit haven't spoken. That it would amount to lying against the Holy Spirit. And it's worried me to think that you know, a lot of the times we hear the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit says, uh, is it some kind of caution for us to be sure the Holy Spirit says before we say the Holy Spirit says. Because if we say 
what the Holy Spirit didn't say and claim it is the Holy Spirit that said, will it amount to blasphemy? And in, in Matthew, Matthew 12, 30, uh, 31 to 32, I don't know whether they, they can put it up. Matthew 12, 31 to 32, can we read that please? I saw something too that was scary. It says, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, I just want to, yeah. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sins and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. So that if you say something against the Holy Spirit, and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That's some very strong sins that cannot be forgiven. We were learning the other time, right? We couldn't come down to that, uh, to that uh, question. The sins, which sins, which are those sins that can be forgiven and the sins that cannot be forgiven. It was one of the questions we wanted to deal with in the, in the uh, interactive session during the, in the uh, Sunday school interactive session. So it, it scares me to say that, you no, know, to see that this is, a proclamation that when you lie, when you say something that the Holy Spirit hasn't said, or when you say something against the Holy Spirit, it cannot be, it's a sin that cannot be forgiven. And so it means that we need to be very sure what we are saying about the Holy Spirit. That's my take on it. I don't know about you. That the Holy Spirit is one sacred that you know you have to be very careful in your relationship, in your utterances concerning the Holy Spirit. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Um, it says every form of malice. We are still looking at some of those things that would uh, cause the Holy Spirit to be grieved, to be annoyed. Every form of malice, rebellion, even disobedience. Let's look at Isaiah sixty-three ten. Isaiah 63.10. Isaiah 63.10. Say, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. They rebelled and vexed. So when there's rebellion, you vex the Holy Spirit. And then continuing, some of those things that can vex the Holy Spirit, non-utilization of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is given to you, and you do not utilize it for the purpose that God has deposited in you. That could also vex the Holy Spirit. And then using the Holy Spirit for personal gains. You have the power of the Spirit in you, working in you, and then you're using it for personal gains. Is there, is there any, does any example come to our mind for use, using the, as for using the, uh, the Holy Spirit in, for personal gains? Does any example come to our mind? Sorry, you are, you, are, you, are, you are blessed with the, with the, with the Holy Spirit. You know? uh, maybe somebody comes to you, you pray, and then get more, collect money on that. On, is, that is that a likelihood? You could grieve the Holy Spirit doing that. You have the power of prophecy, and then you talk. You, know, you, can, you can say things that are likely to happen. It's not your power. It's God that gives you the power. But then you are using it to collect here and there and collecting little, little things in the name of offerings for personal gains. Could that amount to, and I think that could, that could grieve the Holy Spirit. Is that correct? Sorry, sir. Let's, let's have an exchange. I like, I, like, I like to, like I said, I'm also learning. Yes, please. Practically, it's happening in the world we're living today. Mm -hmm. Some churches, they don't know, see, pro, uh, prophesy to somebody, and at the end they said, okay, come and sow this seed to this church. So that can be part of it. Okay. We'll leave it at that. I don't understand on this exalted altar and say some things, but we'll leave it at that. The Lord help us in Jesus' name. Then we also learned about the role of the Holy Spirit. Like we are mentioning, we say the Holy Spirit is a comforter, is a counselor, is a teacher. 
Bible verse there is John 14, 26. No, we, we have all of that. It's a guide. Uh, the Holy, we also learned last week, and it was detailed discussion on the Holy Spirit being a convicting spirit, right? And then uh, believe that the Holy Spirit is sent to illuminate or interpret God's message in the life of every Christian. He transmits from divinity and reveals unto us humanity. Amen? So that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. But then let's give, let's give this, some context to this Holy Spirit thing. Because sometimes when they say uh, you receive the power, receive the Holy Spirit, you know. When I read, it's a very long, it's a very long session of the Bible from 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 3, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 1 Corinthians 3, 3. I will not want us to read it now for time, no, please. I, I like, I like, I like, maybe you could read it at home. Say, but it is written, I have not seen that, that, that. If you go further, it tells you that the Holy Spirit at, at birth, at new birth, the Holy Spirit is deposited inside us. Okay? It is up to the born-again Christian to activate this, this, this spirit and to make it work in you for the purpose that God has intended it. I would like for us to read that, if, if we can, just... Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 from, to 1 Corinthians 3, 3. It's a very long, long scripture. So it is my contention that the Holy Spirit is given and should be activated by believers to achieve God's purpose. God didn't just give us the Holy Spirit to, uh, to just bless us. It is to achieve God's purpose. God has a purpose for releasing the Holy Spirit unto us. And so we need to achieve that purpose. And that's the dimension we are taking our discussion to, to, to tonight. To look at those purposes that we think that God, for which God has deposited the Holy Spirit in us, for which we need to activate and fulfill the purpose. May the Lord help us even as we read in Jesus' name. But before we go to look at those purposes for which the Holy Spirit is de delivered to us, let us look at what the Holy Spirit is not. To my mind, I believe that the Holy Spirit is not, I just itemized about three, three of them there. The Holy Spirit is not given just for your self-benefit. I don't think that God just gives you to, yes, God, the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it edifies you, it's, it comforts you, it teaches you. But all of that is not just for your benefit alone, for your own good alone. It's to, for your good but to enable you to do God's work. Amen? So I believe God <clears throat> didn't give the Holy Spirit to believers for our personal good alone. And then two, I believe that the Holy Spirit is not a measure of self-righteousness, of our self-righteousness, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a measure of our self-righteousness. The Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags. So it's not because of your works, your righteousness, that God will fill you with the Holy Spirit. I doubt that. So if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you activated it, it's working, it is for a purpose. We'll come back to that purpose. And then I also said that I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is meant to lie idle within us. Yes, we have the Spirit of God in us, but we are to activate it and work with it. All right? And so what are those purposes for which the Holy Spirit is given to us. I believe there are errands that the Holy Spirit gives to us, and that's why I titled the topic for today, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, run his errands. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, run his errands, because there are some errands that I believe God wants us to run. So let's go back to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, from verse 1 to 3. He says, this is Is the, the prophet Isaiah speaking here. He said, this, the Holy Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord had anointed me. I like to also underline the word because there. He said, the Holy Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the, unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Chapter 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. 
to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirits of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That for me, in that three verse, captures a whole lot that the Holy Spirit wants us to do. So let's try to unpack them. Let's try, let's try to unpack what and what is there. You see, first, I, I, like I said, we underline the word because. And I'm not an English major, but I know that when you say because, it tells us this is the reason for that. Correct? The Holy Spirit is upon me because he has anointed me to, correct? That means the Holy Spirit was upon him because he has anointed him to do all of that. So the Holy Spirit was given for a purpose, right? And that was the purpose he started to list after the because. Does that, does that make sense in English? Like I said, I'm not an English major, okay? So he said because. But that very Bible scripture was actually... Uh, what, what theologians will call it, or Bible scholars will call it, uh, messia one of those messianic scriptures in the Bible. There are some of those scriptures in the Old Testament that foretold about the coming of our Lord Jesus, of the Messiah, all right? But then we also remember that somewhere in, was it in Mark or so, Jesus himself also confirmed this scripture, all right? In Luke, Luke 4, 18 to 19. Luke 4, 18 to 19. Can we, can we get Luke 4, 18 to 19? The book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18 to 19. That's Jesus speaking now. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, had, he was speaking. Here, Jesus was speaking in the temple. Okay? And he was reading. He was making reference to what Isaiah has said. He says, the Holy Spirit of the Lord is upon me, was reading the book of Isaiah. Because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Okay? To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay? Do, do go further a bit. Do go further. Let's go to 20. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 20. He had closed the books, and he closed the books, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And his eyes, the eyes, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogues were fasting on him. Go for that, 21. And he began to say unto them, he began to say unto them, say, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. This is Christ saying that by his coming, this scripture is fulfilled in the eyes. The scripture that Isaiah wrote many, many years ago, long before he came to earth, that the day, because of his presence, this scripture was fulfilled. That means that prophecy that Isaiah made way back then, the coming of Christ, the Messiah himself has come. He has come to fulfill the scripture. And so, what are those things that he has come to fulfill? Back again to Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The first thing that it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach that. He says, he has to preach good tidings to the poor. He has to preach good tidings to the poor. And to my mind, that should be the reason for which the Holy Spirit was given to him. The Holy Spirit was, uh, the, the Holy Spirit was, he says, the, the, the Spirit of God is upon me. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, correct? The Spirit of God is upon him because he was given, he has been given this job to do. He has been anointed to do this, 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 this. And so that Spirit is upon us to do the same thing. Because we remember, Jesus says we should occupy till what? He comes back, correct? So that which he has said to do, that also he has called us to do. 
by that enabling of the Holy Spirit. And so when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not for our personal aggrandizement. It's not for our personal you know, show off. It's not for our personal yeah, embodiment. But it's only meant to strengthen us, to enable us to do that which Christ has asked us to do. So there's a reason for the Holy Spirit being anointed, being given the release unto the, or to Christ himself. That same reason is what me and you is supposed to be doing. That's the errand that the Holy Spirit has sent us for which we need the Holy Spirit to continue to do it. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. And so first he says to preach good tidings to the poor. Say we are to preach and to show forth the deliverance, not just preach in words, but to show forth the evidence of good news, of the good news of God's unfailing love and his inexhaustible provisions to the poor. There are several poor amongst us. All around us, they are the poor. Poor in spirit, poor financially, poor, in, poor physically, emotionally. We are to preach good tidings to them. We have to take the good news of, of Christ to them. When the poor are taught to depend on God as their source, Jesus assures us in Luke 6.20, that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And all its provisions. We should be filled with the Holy Spirit and to do the work of pointing the poor and showing them the way of Christ. That is one of the assignments I think we need to run as errand for the Holy Spirit. The second assignment, the second errand we have to run for the Holy Spirit is to heal the brokenhearted. Back in Isaiah, it tells us that he has to heal the brokenhearted. There's no shortage of people who are suffering heartbreak around us, within our sphere. We are to take the message to them to heal them. Say, God cares for all the hearts that have been and still been broken in one way or the other, and are in a state of despair. Honestly, sometimes when you, when you encounter pastors, you know what people are going through, or if you are a counselor yourself. Okay, but it seems like these days, maybe because uh, I don't know about counselors, uh, people seem to have more confidence in discussing their issues with pastors. That's the ones who, 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 who can come up. If you encounter pastors, they will, not give you, they will not give you directly, but when they tell you the kind of things that people come to them for, for prayers and all of that, you will know that people are really suffering. A lot of people are going through challenges and heartbreak. So the persons we pass on the road, even on our workplaces, you know, and they look good on just the looks alone. But what some of them may be carrying will be too much for them. I encountered a lady not too long ago. Uh, you know, typical African man I saw twins. This excitement in seeing twins, you know, I said, ah, beautiful children. You know, I wanted to help her. She was struggling to carry them out, uh, carry the two children out of the, out of the car. Yes, there was a third. So I struggled to go. I tried to help her, you know. I was now commenting on the children and complimenting them. She says that they are actually her grandchildren. Oh, I was shocked. The lady was barely 30 something. Maybe, maybe in her late 20s or early 30s. She said, These are her grandchildren. Grandchildren. It's not strange around this part, though. So, but then. We got talking, and then she opened up a bit. I don't know why. Actually, it was the, script, the scripture, the, uh, this pamphlet in my hand, I wanted to reach out to her. So we got talking. Perhaps out of that confidence, she got talking to me. That I now said, I said, the parents, I, I guess I, I triggered it all. I said, the parents would be very happy, happy people. I said, where are they? So then she broke down. She let me know that the father of the twins is in jail. Father of the twins is in jail, and he was talking further and out of pity, talking further. Her own mother is in hospice. Her father is suffering MS. All of these I got to know, just walking a short walk down from the ocean. 
You just imagine all of this packed on, be heaped on one person. Mother in hospice, just nearing death. Father suffering from multiple sclerosis. Only son in jail. She's having to fend for grandchildren. No husband. She's a single woman. That was just one example of the several things that you know the, that the people we see, you know, even you may not have to tell people your own story, but we carry all of it with a good face and a good attitude. May God help us. There are broken-hearted people all around in our sphere. We may not go searching for them, but when we take the news of Christ to them. Perhaps they will just, that may just be the only thing that they get. It may just be the thing that seals them from suicide. Back in, during COVID, I had reason to, because people were locked up at home, I was watching some of these, you know, I had time to be watching some of these things on TV. Jail, there was this, uh, this thing about jail, you know, and you just see the life of people that are being wasted. A lot of people are going through tough times. And so one of the things, one of the errands that I think the Holy Spirit is empowering us to go out to run is to bring these same people to bind their broken hearts, to help in binding their broken hearts. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. As believers, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and on errand to bring God's word to mend these hearts in our spheres that are broken and shattered. And then number three says to proclaim liberty to the captives. A lot of people are in captivity. Captivity of different forms. I said there are too many persons that are held captive in and around us and at different levels of captivity. They are captives of sin. They are captives of demonic social vices. There are some persons who are in some, they are tied up in some social vices, drug addiction, whatever it is, prostitution, that they themselves don't like it. They know they are in the, they, they know they are in the wrong, wrong place. They don't like it, but they can't help it. That's the clear definition of captivity. The people in jail, I was talking about this jail, this uh, uh, program on jail, you know, the life in jail. A lot of them don't like it, but some of them, when they come out to society, they find themselves misfits in society. They want to go back because they have stayed there for so long. That's the only life they know. These are some of the persons who are scattered all around us in this same world we live in, in these same areas that we live in, in the same workplaces that we go to, that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is enabling us to go out and reach out to them to proclaim liberty and set them free. They are captives of economic strangulation, captives of spiritual bondage, captives of broken and a dysfunctional society. Talk about a dysfunctional society. God help us. There's a whole lot of good things about this society, but there are also things that are dysfunctional about this society. There is topic about uh, there's this. Uh, it helps. It helps me understand the the the, the, the mindsets around. You know, uh, there's a, a TV program on a divorce, divorce court. When you hear some of the stories that some persons come to divorce court with, you would you you you, you wonder whether human beings you know <laughs> they are, what what reasoning goes through their head. But it just tells you the level at which some persons reason. For me, I just it gives me an understanding of what is not it's not the one-off incidents. It just 
regular as a country divorce court. You know, it's aired on television. And they say it's life. That they are true stories, not acted. Somebody is at twenty at fifteen year old, you ran ran away with a with a sixteen year old boy. By twenty they had had four children. I just may the Lord help us in Jesus' name. But I believe that such are the areas that God Almighty has enabled us by the power of the Holy Spirit to go out and do his work and to proclaim liberty to those set of people in such dysfunctional societies and dysfunctional systems. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Number four, it says to comfort those who mourn. To comfort those who mourn. Uh, when we go, go further there, he was talking about ashes, you know, uh, to give them beauty for ashes. Uh, I'm sure we understand that uh, back, in, the, back in, in Bible times, that uh, when somebody is mourning, they say they wear sackcloth and ashes, correct? Sackcloth and ashes. So in replacement for the ashes that they are heaped on persons whose lives are really in real torment, burnt out, I believe we have that enablement of the Holy Spirit to go out and give them beauty for ashes. And the beauty they come with is a beauty in the word of God Almighty. A beauty in the word of God Almighty. As Paul and Peter says, gold and silver we have none, but what we have we give to you. For some of them, it may not be finance that will solve their problems. It may just be hearing the word that will change their lives. May the Lord enable us to do such in the name of Jesus. So in biblical times, ashes were commonly used as a visible sign of mourning. Some of the persons we encounter on life's crossroads have heaps of ashes all over their souls to express their mourning state, resulting from some of the most brutal hurts they have suffered or are still suffering in their journey through life. It could be physical death to either a physical death to a loved one. And like I was telling the story of this lady just now, she's just hurting, seriously hurting. Why, and there are several like that. There was a young man I know one time, uh, somebody was being sent to go take care of him. He's from, from neck down, he's, he can't he can use from neck down. And the only dependent he has is an old woman who herself needs assistance. And those are the only two people that they know, know themselves in life. There's no father in their lives. You are the father, nobody knows the story about the father. So when, when, you, when, you, when you hear such stories, you know how people are truly hurting. The heap of ashes is upon them, and these persons are around. I understand the privacy about here, but somehow when we take the word to them, the word may help them, may sow a seed that helps them to stay, because some of them are at the point of giving up. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. He said, by, enabling, by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, we are on errand to reach out and bring these, these ones mourning beauty for their ashes. This is all the more so for those who mourn in Zion. When the Bible talks about those who mourn in Zion, I believe he's talking about Zion is a seat of God. And so, translated to today, I believe Zion is those who mourn even within the church. Within the church, there are those who mourn, who hurt. Yes, we are called as, as Christians, but there are within us members who come in here Sunday in and Sunday out who are going through tough times. We're not, we don't need to go around asking them, oh, what are you going through? But let's, let's be able to send out love. Let's be able to dispel love. Let's be, uh, sorry, let's be able to give out love and be able to reach out to people 
so that it make them feel welcome. Because a lot of persons who come into church may just come here and go, and nothing changes. But we need to do more than that so that the word of God will truly abide in their hearts and cause some healing and comfort to them. For those who mourn in Zion, those who are believers in the household of faith, who suffer such soul-wrenching and faith-challenging difficulties, particularly those ones, so the difficulties they may have prayed and prayed, fasted and fasted, but yet the challenges are still there. They will need some form of encouragement from brethren to help out and stay their faith. Otherwise, their faith will be tested seriously. Let us run this errand faithfully. Let's engage the Holy Spirit to bring the fragrance of the oil of joy to their mourning and adorn their lives with a garment of praise. Because those, well, if you read that Isaiah 61, 1 to 3 again, those were the things that we are expected to do to bring the oil of joy to their mourning. And the oil of joy is like, uh, my understanding was that in those days, you know, when, because that terrain where Jesus was, you know, and where Jesus uh, ministered was uh, a desert, rough terrain. When people come through, they, 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 uh, their feet, before they get to your, to your place, their feet will be very dusty and all of that. You know? So it was their tradition to always have a pot of water outside you know, to wash their legs. And then you, as a good host, you have to put oil, to apply oil on their feet so that as you come into the house, there's sweet aroma that comes on. So such is the oil of joy that we have to bring to such persons who, who's, who, for whom life travails have taken a toll on. May the Lord help us even as we understand this and do them in the name of Jesus. And then it says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord. And what is the acceptable year of the Lord? It says we are to bring good news of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, which has brought liberty and freedom or brought jubilee to all of them. The acceptable year of the Lord. If we read in Leviticus, is the year of liberty. The year of liberty. So we are to bring liberty to these people, jubilee to these people. The year of jubilee was said to be 50 years. In, Levit in Levitical times, they said uh, every 50 years, you no know, slaves were set free. If you are owing debt, after 50 years, the debt could turn to zero. Okay, it was liberty for everybody. It was given by God in the time of, uh, uh, the, as, as part of the uh, logistical laws that were given to Moses to guide them on their journey through the desert. And so we are to proclaim the year of Jubilee, the acceptable year of the Lord, the freedom for everybody. And so what is the, what is the freedom that we have for them now that Christ has died on the cross of Calvary and by that death he has paid the price for all the bondage, everything that holds them captive. So they are to lean in on that and to take freedom from it. And the Lord will help us do it in Jesus' name. So that is part of the, uh, the errand that the Holy Spirit has laid in our hearts that we must do. And that thereby we are assured the, the, uh, the, that the world is assured of freedom for all the slaves to sin and their debts are set free. And all who labor and who are heavy laden by, by the world's circumstances and situation, they will be set free. We are to proclaim the day of liberty unto them. And then six, we are to also declare day of vengeance of our God. We are to declare day of vengeance of our God. If we give them all of what Christ has done, the sacrifice that he has paid on the cross of Calvary, as the open door for, for them to get freedom from the captivity and all of that, we are also to, to let them know uh, to caution them that uh, those who refuse the condition of Christ's jubilee, okay, there is a day of divine judgment, which is the day of vengeance. Those who reject God's mercy will also face the, uh, the, the uh, consequences 
That's in Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. And it says, this is our calling by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So if we fail to take, to take eternal life as laid for us by Christ Jesus, then that will know that there's the wages of sin, which is the day of vengeance of our God. There is a, a day of judgment that is coming. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And then seven, it says, by the Holy Spirit leading, our works should produce abiding fruits. Because in that, in that verse, Isaiah 61, 1 to, uh, through uh, 3, it is talking about that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So our works should produce abiding fruits. When we go out with this message of freedom, of liberty, that Christ has wrought on Calvary's cross for these people, that we should be able to have abiding fruits to show for it, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Da, 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 and then in the last sentence, it says, in the last sentence, there says that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And so our efforts, our works should produce abiding fruits, going out by the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the good news, heal the brokenhearted, bind their, their wounds. All of these should be able to provide, abide, to, should be able to produce abiding fruits that may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Amen. And so this will be the errand that the Holy Spirit deposited in us should be activated to, to cause us to go out for, for to accomplish these errands, not for our personal self alone or for personal improvement alone. Yes, we are improved. Yes, we are empowered. Yes, we, 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 we hear of God. We are, we, we the Holy Spirit communicates God's mind to us, but not only for our personal benefits, it is to be able to deliver all of this for the benefit of our God. And Lord, help us to understand so that we can do it and do it faithfully in Jesus' name. Any questions? Yes, sir. It's a good thing you all have asked. Yes. Does it mean that um, the gift is being passed from one person to another? Absolutely so, sir. I would think so. Or what, what do you think? Let me, before we even say so. It's somewhere in somewhere in Corinthians. You know, when we are talking about activating, because I believe the Holy Spirit is the full armor to all Christians. So when I mean what I mean by full armor is that anything you need in every particular situation is there. But it's up to you just to activate it. And the only people that have access to it are the Christians after you've given your life to Christ. So I was thinking that everybody got all these gifts, but it's up to you to activate it. That's why I asked the question, does it mean it's different from one person to another? Because you have not activated the particular one that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that one of the common ones is that everybody listens to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Right. I'm one of them. Right. I listen to it. Mm -hmm. So to some people, fine, they activated the vision. The, the, gift, the gift of vision. The gift of vision. Mm -hmm. So if I continue to fellowship with the Lord constantly and I 
You may receive the gift of vision and be able to see in vision. Yeah. So that's what I was just thinking. I was just trying to clear my conscience while mm. I was here. That okay. At least everybody have is like a full armor for we Christians to fit. So it's left for us to activate okay. the one we need to do. Anybody wants to make a comment on that? Pay a price, you know, to actually walk in certain dimensions. You can't just say, "I want to, I want to work in the office of a prophet without paying the price to be a prophet." Okay. Understand? There's a price you pay. You have to spend time with the Holy Spirit for you to get to that level. It's like the gift. It's like the the fruit of the Spirit: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. If you've not actually spent time with the Holy Spirit, you cannot be working in love. You cannot be working in all those um, fruits. It's the more you spend time with him, the more you grow in the spirit, the more you can actually now start working in that gift that he has deposited inside of you. But then I feel like we all have that natural gift that you can operate in easily, you understand, because, the, because he has given you that gift. Now, for you to now go from that gift to another level, you have to pay the price. That's where that paying that price comes into effect. Amen. Is it also possible that um, our callings may be different? What God expects us to do yeah, may be different. What he expects me to do it may be different from what he expects you to do. And so he will give you gifts that is appropriate for the calling. Is, it, is that possible? Yes, I think that's why the Bible says some have, we have eyes, just like the whole body is different. The mm -hmm. head, the eye, mm -hmm. the this, because we all can be all eyes. Absolutely. We all can be all ears. Absolutely. So that's why. of pastors, but some people are called into it. That's the difference. Then when it comes to the issue of gifts, like that Lily said, you know, because of the Holy Spirit that we have, is a gift. Some people naturally, God has given them. So it's the Holy Spirit that actually helps them to have the consciousness of, I think I have this gift. I think I have this gift. Because I, I remember the ones that happened to me. I think I have this. Before somebody told me, I think, madam, you have this gift. Because I've been having the consciousness of it. Then, like she now said, you can still pray that God help me to discern this particular thing. But gifts are gifts. I don't think you pay a price. You don't pay. Don't use the word pay. Don't use... Because it's, it's what I'm trying to say. You have to have made the sacrifice. I guess that's the word yes, that was coming to me. You have to have made the sacrifice to, to get to that level. Things, those are the things okay, that it's like it's scared it's, people away. It's like when you go to work. When you go to work now, uh, you are going to work. You are paying. You are, you, are, you are giving them your time, and they are paying you for your time. So now that, that the payment is that time you are taking out of your daily schedule to pass to spend that time in God's presence. There's this book I'm reading. It's called The Work of the Spirit, The Work of Power. Yeah. You understand? The guy actually, he quit his job. Yes. And he decided that for that eight hours that he usually go to work, he's going to spend that eight hours praying. So, you know, he, he just, he, so he started by the first day he went there, he 
said praying, this is normal um, language. And as he was praying and praying, he found out that before a few minutes, he has already exhausted praying everything. And at the point, he was like, what is he going to say now? So he just started speaking in tongues. So he started speaking in tongues eight hours every day for months. And before he knew it, the first program they invited him to, this was, so, this was someone that was afraid. He opened a church. He had a church. But he couldn't stand and preach. He needed to invite people to come and preach for him. But after spending months just praying in tongues, the first program he went to, he just saw, he saw, he didn't know that the woman couldn't walk. He said he was looking at the woman and he started seeing an x-ray. And just like I asked the woman, can I pray for you? And the woman said yes. Immediately he got down, held her leg. And when he saw her leg, he said he was even afraid. Because he saw that the one, of, one of the legs was six inches shorter than the other one. So he closed his eye and he had just held her leg and he started praying. He said that there was people around that were saying that the minute he held her leg and started praying, that the other leg grew six inches. And the woman got up and she was walking with her flushes and everything. If he had not spent those eight hours praying. Uh, we, we, both, we are both saying the same thing. Maybe the terms we are using. Like what, what I said was that fellowshipping, the more you fellowshipping with the Lord, the more things he's going to reveal to you. Because when we use the word pay, that means I paid you, then give me back. So we are, we are doing pro, 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 pro. <laughs> quick, quick pro, pro, cool, huh? <laughs> Amen. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I Praise like, God, okay. Yeah, okay. In the book of Acts, you remember the girl that could see that the, the people were using to get money. Mm -hmm. You know, the apostles, they reduced that. Then you remember the man that came to pay them so that he can, because that's the mentality of that man that with my cash, they can lay hand on me, I can have this thing, and I can start manifesting. Are you getting? But when you use that word, fellowship, the word sacrifice, spend the time, I think it's more of than, I, I understand what you're saying. We're all saying the same thing. The, the maturity, because this word, the maturity of it, there is still the maturity of whatever we are saying. Because I've seen somebody that told me, he said Christianity is hard. The young girls that in Nigeria way back, they would look at me like, why are you coping as a pastor's wife? They are scared to be a pastor's wife. And I remember when my husband started, our pastor, it took them two weeks. The wife and the pastor, they were always calling me every day by day. Once they see me, they will be looking at me. They will be looking at me. The next, they will call me. Are you prepared for the work ahead? I was like, this, this something was instilling fear in me, to be sincere. Then the next thing, one day, she called me again. And me, whenever they do that, I go back, I was like, God, what is happening? Give me the understanding. Help me to see. Then one day, there was something I told her. I said, ma'am, my husband was actually created by God. I wasn't there. Then the God that brought me to him, he knows why. If he has called him, who am I to stop him? And that was the, way the, the day the woman stopped telling me whatever she started telling me. Then the, the husband now called me and said, Sister Fee, they called him by my husband's name. Do you understand? I said, sir, I don't need to understand it. The God that has called me and brought me into his life will help us with the understanding we need. And with every when I started saying that, did I knew that I think there is an understanding this woman has? They left me. And God started manifesting and manifesting and manifesting. Because so many people with the words, we are correct though, but the words that we use kill so many people from Christianity. And I keep telling them, it's as easy as you being a church comma as a member, just normal member. It's as easy as it's only you will just fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The Lord help us in Jesus' name. But then I will leave us with, just for a time. I'm sorry we are taking a little time. But uh, I'll leave us with this last question. Uh, if you are truly not called to the office of a prophet, God hasn't called you to the office of a prophet, perhaps not known to you. Is there any amount of time you can spend in his presence that would give you prophecy, give you the, 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 the spirit of prophecy? And I, I just leave that as a question that perhaps you can go home with. 
May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. And so the Holy Spirit is in a believer is meant to empower the believer to run the errands of the Holy Spirit. Let's activate and run this errand so that we don't use the Holy Spirit, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit by not using it for the purpose for which it is intended. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Come rise. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor, praise God, praise God, hallelujah, praise God, amen, praise God, hallelujah, praise God, amen. Let's also open our mouths and glorify this God, give him praise, thank him for his revelation power, thank him for his encounter with us today. Thank him for his breathing on his word today. Thank him for the fact that we have encountered him and that as we go out here from today, we will not remain the same. Thank him that he will, these sweet seeds that he has sowed in us, that he will reveal to us even more of himself in the name of Jesus, that we'll encounter the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit will be activated in us. And these errands for which the Holy Spirit has filled us, we will go and discharge them. In the name of Jesus, mighty God, we thank you. Thank you for this encounter. Thank you for meeting us, even at the point of our need. Thank you for revealing to us who you are. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for bringing comfort to us. Thank you for sending us on this, for counting us worthy to send us on this errand. Papa, enable us that even as we go, let us do your work and do it faithfully in the name of Jesus, in the manner that is acceptable to you, in the manner that will meet your, 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 your favor, in the manner that will receive favor from your throne, in the name of Jesus. Baba, we glorify your name. We give you praise that even as we go, Father, you will go with us. Let your Holy Spirit take us out <coughs> and bring us back safely every time we go, every inch of the way, Father, other steps in the name of Jesus. That as we go, Father, you go with us. Let your spirit always abide with us. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, I believe on Friday we have, uh, we'll have uh, the prayers uh, on Friday by 8, correct? Uh, yeah. And then uh, as we go out, uh, we remember to... Uh, drop our offering, and then uh, on Sundays, as usual, please invite people. Uh, worship worship service begins at uh, 9.30 with Sunday school, and then uh, 10 o'clock, the main service itself. May the Lord help us and go with us. And so let's, let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. For surely... God's goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever and evermore. Amen. God bless you.